Hello there everyone. Hopefully you're still praying for rain and planning for drought. Uh, this is Tans Herman, Grazing Land Soil Health Specialist with USDA's NRCS in South Dakota. And I'm here with Luke Herman today. Luke, would you tell us a little bit about uh, your story, where we're at, and uh, your venturing, I guess you might say, into a recognition of needing to plan for drought? Sure. Well, uh, thanks for having me as part of this program. I'm excited to kind of help out whatever way I can, I guess. Um, I guess my, my background goes uh, back, I grew up on this place and um, I, uh, funny enough, I was born during the drought years of the 80s, I guess. So my parents, you know, uh, as they were getting started, um, you know, with the young family and starting to build uh, build the business, they, uh, they had to deal with some pretty extreme years, not just with drought, but low prices and high interest rates and, and uh, plenty of challenges. So I think that, um, you know, the awareness of the need for having a plan was, I mean, that's been part of my life since, you know, since I was born basically. But, um, you know, more recently, uh, you know, I, as I have been involved with the ranch, you know, growing up and, you know, after college and everything, you know, I went through the, some of those drought years, uh, you know, in different capacities as a, you know, a, a kid or a young adult, but probably most I was the most involved in 2017 with that that drought because at that point I was you know had been you know here for 10 years af after college and um, was taking on more and more responsibility and and that was the first year that I had to kind of come up with the drought plan um, with dad's help of course and his guidance and, and um, insights but it was kind of my my responsibility to to come up with the plan in the first place, and um, and then then uh, be able to explain it to Dad and and uh, you know justify why I think we should do what we did, and um, and so that was a, a really um, it was a, I learned more in that year than probably the ten years previous as far as how to manage a ranch period, but then especially when things are changing and. Um, just having to think through all the implications of taking different steps, and uh, so, so yeah, that was that was the year that I think it everything really kind of hit home, and these lessons that I learned up until that point were that was when we put them into practice, and so yeah. If, if I'm hearing any common themes about what you what you just said, or or, or summaries of what you just said, is a this is a business, and it will mm -hmm. be run as such. Yep. But it's a family business. Um, therefore, communication needs to happen, and uh, where there's multiple generations involved, and, and having a real stake in what in the outcomes are, um, we've got to have buy-in. And thirdly, but maybe most importantly, when we go back to the first point I made about uh, this is a business, is that mm -hmm. you have to be aware of all your resources. Yep. That's how much grass production is there. What do we have in the feed yards? Uh, for haystacks or, or other forages. Uh, how many animals do we have to feed? And what classes and, and all of those things that that uh, really land on the balance sheet, but so much of it also is, do we have the labor? Do we have right. the skill sets? Do we have the necessary tools or infrastructure to implement what we are probably gonna have to do if it continues to be dry? Yeah, yeah, and, and I think kind of along with that, I also recognized um, I felt like for the month of May and June, I might as well just glued my phone to my ear because I was on the phone all the time with somebody about something, whether it was feed or hauling cattle or health papers or just, I mean, it was, it was just nonstop because it was all new to me, you know, mm -hmm. and, and some of these things that we were talking about doing, we hadn't ever done before. And so there was a steep learning curve on a lot of that. Um, but I also recognized as the the year went on and especially looking back on that year that there were some big opportunities that I think I missed that I could have done I could have managed better you know um, and not that it I mean I was actually um, I was very pleased with how the projections that I made and as I said as I put into practice all the things that I had been taught and I had learned over over the years um, it really came out pretty close to what I had planned or projected you know at the beginning of the year but like I said there were some things that could I could have done a little differently or a little better that would have made a noticeable difference, you know, on the, the bottom line. 
Sure, so. sure. Well, hindsight's always twenty twenty. Always is, yeah. And yeah. Um, if we've learned anything from the other ranchers we've interviewed in the series is that with every adversity, we learn something, mm -hmm. right? Yep. And, yeah. And I suspect you'll tell us more about some of those things you've learned yeah. as we go through our sure. interview. Will, will you tell us where we're at geographically? Yeah, so so we're uh, our place is in north central South Dakota, we're twelve miles or thirty two miles north west of Holven, um, about an hour and a half straight north of Pier, okay. and uh, so yeah, that's and we've been kind of well, we've been on the edge of a lot of the drought. Um, you know, when you look at the the drought maps, we're definitely in it. Um, we're not in the worst of it, and but we're just kind of always on that in the, on that edge. You know, and it seems like it's never that far away where they're either getting it way worse than we are or they're catching a little bit of rain and so we're sort of in one of the transition zones I think. Certainly. So. Uh, it seems like the Missouri River does that kind of yeah. north, north through south all the way through our state a yeah. lot of times. Um, so are you noticing some impacts? Yes we have. Uh, last year and I, I apologize I don't have the precipitation records fresh in my mind but we we were dry well this is our second open winter we've had where we've had hardly any snow at all and so um and you know last uh, spring of 21 we didn't have uh, a great deal of moisture we were short and uh, and it stayed you know hot and dry like everybody else until we got to about the third week of august and we then we got oh, five or six seven inches of rain somewhere in there between the end of august and first of october probably and uh and uh, we were all thinking, oh, the drought broke, you know, oh, here we go, and better prepare for, uh, you know, a lot of snow this winter. Well, then we went into this winter where we didn't, I mean, I don't think we had four or five inches of snow altogether. And uh, this spring we've had half inch of rain is about it. So, yeah, there's definitely, we're definitely seeing uh, impacts uh, on, uh, on forage production. And even things like ground cover and some things like that are kind of, um, yeah, it's different. But, yeah. Uh, yeah talk more about that here moving forward. You mentioned that that maybe ground cover is is decreasing a little bit. Mm -hmm. you know, we're talking about those plant residues that we want in contact with the soil surface to buffer the impact of a raindrop, to buffer soil temperatures as the as the spring and summer kick in. Um, because we know biology, much like humans, kind of like things in that uh, 68 to 72, 74 degree range to be optimally effective. Um, as well as most, and, and the plants are most moisture efficient when the soil is, is at that temperature or cooler. Um, so what do you think are the causes leading to maybe this, this reversal in the amount of ground cover? Well, I mean, the, the biggest thing there's, is there's not new grass being grown mm -hmm. to lay down to, to kind of maintain that. You know, that's, that's the primary thing. And I, I, the other day I was, I just kind of drove around and, um, you know, visually assessed uh, some of the pastures, about maybe a fourth of the pastures uh, that are kind of closer to the home here. And it was a noticeable difference depending on when we grazed those pastures last summer. Mm -hmm. And those that were grazed as the grass kind of went dormant, uh, we'll say in, in July most notably, um, those places actually look pretty decent. Like there's there was a, a fair amount of cool season grass that, that grew, you know, sometimes up to seven or eight inches of, of new growth after we got that August rain and mm -hmm. things kind of um, kind of changed there during the, the last part of the summer. Um, but the pastures that got used in, in like May and June, it's like it just stressed that grass a little extra because it was trying to grow, but the, it was, you know, struggling anyways. And then we came and grazed it off and, um, and then that, it was dry. And then it was dry. And it, th that stuff never had a chance to really recover. And even when the rains came, it, it still didn't grow to the level that the grass that didn't get grazed until July mm -hmm. did, which seems backwards, you know, that to me mm -hmm. that that a longer recovery period didn't necessarily um, matter. Yeah, it didn't you know? correlate in that instance. Yeah. And, and I think you, you probably pointed it out, though, is that... Uh, what growth stage was it in yep. when it was grazed. Uh, even though the other plants later in the summer were grazed, uh, while they were stressed due to dry conditions, 
they had also reached a higher level of maturity. There yep. was more green leaf, and subsequently we can presume there was more vibrant root mass uh, mm -hmm. being able to kind of absorb that grazing use. Yep. And, and it just went back to regrowth and recovery as soon as moisture returned. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, the I mean, ground cover is something that we're always visually assessing. Like, if, I'm looking at not only the grass that's growing, but what's it look like on the ground. Mm -hmm. And um, there are places, a few places, where our ground cover is less. And, well, uh, and it's mostly those places that we graze kind of early in the spring, or early in the summer, that didn't have the growth coming back. And, you know, normally those would be the ones that would probably kind of be going to, you know, this time of the year again, like, because they've had the longest recovery, but it's actually, I'm, I've had to switch what my, in, my grazing plan that I write during the winter time <laughs> when, before things are, you know, already adapting and you haven't even turned out yet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So, so yeah, just the, the, some of the rules that we kind of usually think of are kind of out the window this year as far as, uh, so it, you can't replace going out and looking. Yep. You know. Yep. There's definitely value in having that plan, but mm -hmm. that, that observation is absolutely yep. necessary. Good. Um, cause yeah, you're in this long for the long term, right? You're yeah. Not here to cash in and out on an annual basis. Um, it, this is a resource that is renewable mm -hmm. so long as we take good care of it. All right. Because yeah. if we don't, we know, and we can see this in our ecological site descriptions that NRCS has online is that plant communities, regardless of the soils, um, will shift due to management or lack thereof. Mm -hmm. And uh, and usually when we see a, a declining trend in in plants, it's to something less desirable than what the native plant species was. It's less mm -hmm. productive, it's less palatable. Uh, it generally yields more water in the form of runoff and less mm -hmm. infiltration, uh, which then would support growth, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah. I'll take that opportunity to make mention, folks, that uh, there's a wealth of resources online. In fact, you could you could waste too much time looking online for tools and tricks and, and ideas. But what I would suggest is is uh, reach out to someone like Luke or, or someone else that's a member of the Grassland Coalition or one of the NRCS staff people located in your county and ask them, you know, what ecological sites do I have on my place if, if you don't know? Um, and that would give you a, a comparison point to look at what do I have right now, find out what state your pastures are in right now, and, and at least in average setting, and then uh, almost put down some written goals. You know, if, if it's less than, than ideal in your eyes, then a range management specialist could likely help you develop a plan that could drive things towards what it is that you do want. Luke, here in your neighborhood, you probably have some friends and neighbors um, and, and statewide because I know you have a, a large community of rancher friends. Um, you probably know people who are just flat out of grass. Um, they're, it's not getting started as rapidly this spring as they'd hoped. They maybe took it a little deeper than they wanted to last year and, and now they're feeling like they're out of options. The hay pile is short or gone and they have hard decisions in front of them. Mm -hmm. what, what, how do you address that? How do you, how do you encourage mm -hmm. someone like that? Well, I, I think uh, it kind of goes back to what you're saying about talking to somebody local that knows about you know, good management and finding a mentor I think is a, a big, a really big key um, because, you know, you could go and read a book or read an article or watch some videos and you're going to just be overwhelmed by all of this information and some of it, you know, might not even apply to your context or there might be some really important things that are missing because of your context. So um, I think, you know, finding that, that neighbor that you notice you know, he still has grass left or he doesn't seem as stressed out about the situation as you know, the guys down at the coffee shop or whatever. Um, so I, I think finding somebody that's doing a good job uh, is is the key. And, and and it could be NRCS or, you know, or um, just an agency person that you know that that is well-versed in those things. It doesn't have to be, you know, a certain, 
you know, it doesn't have to be a rancher, it doesn't have to be the agency guy, it can be whoever, you know, mm -hmm. someone who, who's plugged into the right resources. But I think that's important for two reasons. One is if it's somebody local, you can't use the excuse, well, they don't know what it's like out here, you know. Because um, if you're just on a, like a Facebook group or something like that, you're going to get advice from all kinds of people that don't know where you're coming from. And it's really easy to write it off if it's coming from somebody who doesn't really know your situation. Um, and then the other reason is uh, having somebody local is you can actually talk to them. They can come to your place. You can go visit with them. Like having that it's just a personal relationship with somebody rather than, you know, an impersonal communication online or, or whatever. It, 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 there's, that, that adds the human element to it, and, and we need that when times are, are stressful. So, um, so yeah, and, and then they can help you figure out what, what fits, what, you know, where you should start, because they, they got an eye for, for what's going on. Um, and I think the other thing that, uh, um, that, that I would recommend is um, documenting where you're starting from. And you know, take some pictures of, you know, find the worst place on the ranch, the one that you don't want to go to because you know how bad it is. Go, go spend half an hour there and take some pictures. You know, dig a hole. Like just familiarize yourself with where you're starting from, so that as progress starts to be made, you can look back and remember where you came from. But I think another thing that is important is to remember how bad it is. If it's that bad, don't don't forget that. You know, okay, it starts raining, it's really easy to forget about how bad it was because all the grass is growing, you know, and then you get complacent and, you're, and you forget to plan. And you, you just, well, it's just not a burning issue anymore. But if you sear that into your memory, I think that that should be, it, it can serve as motivation for making the necessary changes and saying, hey, I never want to go back to that feeling and that situation. So I know, um, like my parents, that was really what, drove them to make those plans and to start implementing grazing management practices was they didn't want to go back to that, you know, that the day-to-day -day stress of, are we going to be able to make it through this year? And, um, but, so, so they didn't forget, but they also didn't document to the degree that they wish they would have, so that as they made the changes, you know, we, we don't have a lot of pictures of, you know, how bad it was in 1986. Um, and, and they wish they did later on. So, so I think that's that that, that can serve two purposes there. Yeah, so. that's really good advice, and and it can be a, a measuring stick for your mm -hmm. success. Hopefully, it's a long time from now, but the next drought. Yeah. You know, if, yeah. If you've made changes to your management and recognized triggers and and made management decisions such that you don't leave such a lasting Im impact on the landscape. Yep then yeah, that's, that's really helpful. Speaking about <clears throat> finding someone local, a, a mentor, um, and it does, you know, Luke's making a very good point. It does not have to be local though. If, if you're for the first time developing a drought plan and have some general concepts and general ideas mm -hmm. that you think will work for your situation, uh, feel free to reach out to any one of the Grassland Coalition yeah. members that are listed here on the website. But, uh, I think Luke makes a really key point, particularly if you need some, or need or want some on-site support to show someone something, or or just give them a quick drive-through tour of the ranch. It, it's just going to be easier to pull off yeah. because they all have working operations as well, and it's not as easy to to take two days and go make a visit or something like that with drive time and whatnot. So, um, very very helpful. Along those lines too, Luke, I hope maybe you could tell us a little bit about who is on your team as far mm -hmm. as, as folks that are impacted by your decisions, um, but also these could be personal or business uh, partners, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Whether they have a stake in, in the ranch or not is, is a little less relevant, but who, who comes to mind when you're making these hard decisions? Well, it's kind of a long list, actually. Um... As far as people that are impacted by the decisions I make, you know, outside of my immediate family, you know, I got, you know, my, my wife, Naomi, and our four kids. Um, my parents are involved, um, so it affects all of us. I've got um, a couple of employees that, you know, they want to know what we're doing <laughs> so that they 
you know, can kind of prepare for it. Um, and uh, when we're talking about making big changes to the, what we have here for livestock or what kind of, you know, hay operations or whatever we're going to do, I mean, those things, I, I want to, I try to keep all of, you know, all of us on the same page, you know, very frequently we're discussing what, what I'm thinking about and what, what we may do and, and, um, and I like to get their input because, you know, I'm not the only one walking around here that's thinking about these things. And, and uh, so, and, you know, like we talked about earlier, getting their, their buy-in and, and their criticism or their, you know, challenging, you know, an idea. I, I have to be able to prove it. Mm -hmm. or I have to be able to, to back up this idea with a reason beside, other than I just feel like it, you know, or that's what we did last time. Or, you know, I, I got to have a sound reason. And, and they're all good about asking what that is. It, it sounds to me like you have a management style within and, and outside of the family that, uh, that allows people to be safe in giving you feedback. Yeah, I, I, I want it that way. Yeah. You know, I, I'm not a... Um, and some people do manage in a way that is a little more, you know, top down. Mm -hmm. And th there's nothing wrong with that. Sure. Um, if they do a good job of it, you know, some mm -hmm. people are, are really good at that. Um, I'm much more of a consensus builder <laughs> type, I guess, but, mm -hmm. but there's other people we, we have, um, I've got some neighbors that I run share cows with. Um, and, uh, I've got another neighbor that I, uh, he's, he's a partner on our, our yearling, yearling operation. And, um, there's been at times there's been other kind of absentee, um, um, shareholders or stockholders or whatever in different cattle enterprises. Um, so I try to keep all them on the same page so they can make plans accordingly for their financial situation. And um, we run some custom sheep uh, grazing through the, through the summer. So, um, you know, plans may affect, affect their um, logistics of getting sheep here or getting them back, back home again. Um, those are the, the, the primary ones, I guess. Uh, we, and, but... And I learned this in 2017 is uh, the value of having relationships and a network of trusted potential partners, uh, either partners or suppliers or buyers or whatever, just potential people that we would do business with um, that I can trust and I can pick up the phone and, and they trust me to follow through on whatever, whatever I tell them. Um, I mean, that really is really helpful. Um, that's got to yeah. lower stress oh, yeah. immediately. Yeah. yeah. When, when I have confidence that I can send our calves to, to this guy, that guy, or the other guy, and all of them will do a good job and treat me fairly, and um, I don't have to worry about if they're you know, feeding them enough or whatever. Just knowing that I can do that and not feeling like, well, I'm the only one that can do a good job taking care of these cattle, that, that definitely makes some of those decisions a lot easier. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. You speak to something we haven't really yet in the series and, and that's this uh, um, this deep deeply held stockmanship you know that, that gosh if I turn loose of these animals it'll, it may not be done the same way mm -hmm. or as much for their benefit the animals benefit as, as I would like to see and, um, and building that community of like-minded individuals mm -hmm. Uh, who also, though, have their own thoughts and feelings on different topics that you can have a discussion on and even disagree but still remain friends mm -hmm. is, is pretty critical to you. Yeah, yeah, it really is. And, you know, they bring knowledge and expertise and resources that I maybe don't have also. So there's, like I said, there's so many things to learn through other people that, you know, um, if, it, if it just stopped at the learning part of it, a drought is is a profitable thing sometimes if you just if you approach it with that mindset that you know there's things to learn and I want to I'm going to do my best to learn them but but like I said that there's um, people that that uh, we trust to be in business with and that's makes it makes like you said just lowers the stress immensely Tell me more about these stalker sheep, because that, that's something that isn't as common as it used to be, mm -hmm. and I'm curious what angles you approach that from and, and what values are bringing to the ranch. Sure. Well, uh, we've been doing this, I think this will be the fourth summer um, that we've had sheep here, and 
I, I like them more and more as far as fitting our resources, um, both from labor and forage resources. So um, at this point, it's still just a custom grazing thing. Um, we don't own any of them, and uh, that may change in the future, but for now, it's, uh, we're, we're content with, with that. Um, initially, we brought them in to help with some leafy spurge issues that we were having, but just found out that they fit our forage base really, really well, better than just cows. Um, so, um, <laughs> funny enough, uh, leafy spurge is a deep-rooted perennial that doesn't uh, seem to be bothered as much by drought. <laughs> So, and, and a lot of the things that the sheep are eating are not as susceptible to drought. Um, the other thing that we try to really target them on is um, Western snowberry, which, you know, I, again, I don't see that. Visually, I haven't gone out and clipped and weighed anything, which I don't know how you clip and weigh Western snowberry. <laughs> it's a lot of stems, and the sheep don't eat that. But, you know, it, um, that doesn't seem to be, that does not seem to be affected by drought significantly anyways. So, so the sheep have been a really... Uh, appears as though a very uh, um, f flexible or appropriate enterprise to have here, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, I know not every, you know, everyone needs to understand what they have for forage before, you know, I wouldn't, that's not a blanket statement. Everybody should have a third of their stocking <laughs> rated sheep. You know, it's some, some should, some shouldn't. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's up to the individual to decide. But, um, but so, so besides being adapted really well to what we have for forages, um, the flexibility of when they arrive and when they leave again is really nice too. Um, you know, like this year, um, you know, if we would have had early spring, we could have had, and, and adequate moisture, we could have had them here by the end of April, first part of May. Um, but I called them and said, hey, you know, it's, um, we're dry, we better, better hold off uh, until the spurge is ready. <laughs> it's funny that that's what we're kind of, <laughs> everyone else looking at what their western wheatgrass is doing, I'm looking at the, <laughs> the leafy spurge, but but so, so we can push that off, uh, you know, a month really easily. Um, and uh, for the people that we're running them for, it doesn't matter to them. They're shipping ewes out for six weeks every every year. So it's just a matter of which slot we get. Sure. Um, and then come fall, same thing. It's pretty flexible when they go back. Um, and they've even brought us extra sheep in the fall um, as they're buying lambs and different things. Um, you know, another resource that we had never done anything with before was soybean stubble and there you know I've rented some soybean stubble from some neighbors and and use some of our own the sheep can go out and utilize that um, and uh, do really well on it and so there's just they fit a lot of neat things that way and the labor side of it there's uh, there's herders that are, take care of them all the time uh, I still have to design the grazing plan and communicate with those guys regularly on what we're doing but um, it's been a really good a good fit for us sure definitely uh opportunity to use forage that would go unused with yep. just a straight cattle right. operation. It didn't matter what age or class they were, cattle aren't going to utilize leafy spurs, right? Right, right. Um, so. Well, and, and, and again, you know, coming back to the drought part of it, these are all plants that are less impacted by drought conditions mm -hmm. that the sheep are mostly using. You know, I mean, it's just kind of a, it's, a, it's just a, a great fit in that sense, so. Tell me a little bit about their, their, are they still a grazer or are they more of a browser? Well, so the the grazing practices we're using with them generally, and it might change a little bit this year, but um, they're, they're doing daily moves. You know, they, they just get 24 hours on, a, well, it's actually about 22 hours on a on one paddock and then they're moving. Mm -hmm. um, so they're... Uh, they're definitely stripping all the leaves off of the broadleaf plants and the grass they're just kind of grazing um I, I would say they're acting more like a grazer the way that we're generally using them now um if we're just targeting the spurge and we just kind of want to just get through that stuff as quickly as we can because we want to stay ahead of it keep it from making seed then they're more of a browser because they're going to just go pick the leaves off and and they don't have to go any lower than that sure. so so you're seeing that Depending on the management style that you're, yeah. that you're operating under with them in those daily moves, um, they they choose to browse. They'll go after those broadleaf plants, mm -hmm. um, regardless of what it is. It yeah. sounds like. Yeah. Um, you know, when I was a really young kid, my grandfather and uncle had sheep, but I was too young to really notice or care yeah. what they were eating. Sure. Um, 
Yeah. I didn't realize it at the time, but they were being fairly innovative themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, no, neat well, fit and, and something that is less common than it used to be. Yeah, yeah. And uh, like I said, I think um, leaving the profitability of owning sheep, and which from what I hear right now, it's pretty good. Um, mm-hmm. Leaving that aside, I think just as a as far as fitting the resource, it's yeah. it's really a, a, a good deal, and you know it does provide some cash flow for us through the summer. Um, you know, we send a monthly bill for for the grazing, and that helps to pay some grocery bills and whatnot. You know, through the summer. Certainly, and I presume it also provides you an income stream instead of a bill. Yes. For herbicide or some other treatment method. Yep. Yeah, yeah, we and we do have uh, flea beetles out on the spurge, uh, and that that did help. Um, we put them out about 15 years ago for the first time, and th- they made a difference, but not enough, you know, not mm-hmm. enough to uh, for us to be content just doing that. Right. And um, but yeah, I mean, they, and I've done kind of some figures. You know, I'd, if we were going to spray, we'd be looking at, you know, I figure. Twelve to fourteen dollars an acre prorated out over a few years, you know, um, of expense, um, knowing we'd have to come back and do it again and stuff. Um, and instead, we're probably, um, in addition to our cattle grazing, we're probably adding another twelve to fifteen dollars an acre from just from the sheep revenue. So you're looking at a thirty-ish dollars an acre difference mm-hmm. in revenue or cost. Yeah, it's huge. It is, and um, yeah, it's. Those are some rough numbers, but even if I'm even if I'm wrong, if even if that's twice as much as like even if I'm off by a factor of two, mm-hmm. it's still fifteen dollars an acre benefit. Yeah, you know, so it's it's definitely worth looking into um, yeah. for people that are interested in that. Certainly. In addition to uh, the stalker sheep, how else do you diversify or or have flexibility? On this mm-hmm. ranch to, to face drought. Sure. Uh, the the other big uh, part of the, the thing that we would that we use as a tool of greatest to, to manage well either excess or um, or a forage deficiency is is our yearlings um, and that's been a relatively new thing. Also, we started that about 2016 um, or maybe 17 somewhere in there. It was um, uh, we started out with running some steers. Um, from you know May through August or September, and uh, my paradigm as a cow, growing up with a cow calf deal was that yearlings are just a headache. You know, they're, the only yearlings we ever dealt with was our replacement heifers, of course. And uh, but they were just always I don't know. It, it caused us more stress than the cows ever did. It seemed like you know yep, they're wild. They run through fences. Yeah, they're, yeah. They're pacing all the time. Yeah, they yeah they circle the fences <laughs> and they crawl out and all that and. And some of those things, that, you know, I won't say that they're wrong, but part of it was I, I, I think my stockmanship has improved a little bit since, from back when I thought yearlings was so much mm-hmm. of a headache. But um, so I, I guess we I've got better at managing young animals, I guess, as far as handling and, and uh, that sort of thing. But what I really grew to like about them was how easy they were to move. You know, we we could move 500 yearlings, you know, four miles. In a few hours, whereas if those were pairs, there's just no way, you know, the cows are go- or the calves are dropping back or going back to where they came from, and it just moving pairs, whether regardless of the type of forager we had, was just difficult. And I, I grew to really enjoy how easy it was to manage those yearlings. And um, so, besides the logistics of just moving them around our ranch, um, the flexibility of how many do we have, when do we turn them out. And when do we market them? Um, really, you know, a year like this, uh, in the last year, I mean, it just it's so much easier to make decisions on those versus pairs. So, or or, or a cow, just strictly cow calf. So, in 2017, we didn't have the yearling. So, uh, so we did, sorry, we started the yearlings in 18. Yeah, because in 17 we didn't have um, anything other than our replacement heifers. We ended up sending them to Nebraska to a feedlot for the summer, um, getting them bred and bringing them back. And that was a whole host of phone calls. And it just, it was, I mean, it worked fine. Yeah, uh, it wasn't a bad decision, but it was 
a lot of work to get them there and back. Um, I, I would say, in hindsight, that would have been one of those things where I'd find someplace in South Dakota, so I don't have to worry about vet or uh, health papers and vet inspection and that kind of stuff. But, um, but there's still a freight bill both ways, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. um, and then with our our cows, we after 30 days we just shipped everything that hadn't. Or after 30 days of calving, we just shipped everything that they hadn't calved yet. Um, which was good, like long term, that helped tighten up our calving window for for a while, and that was a good decision. But it was also stressful going and sorting these cows out as they're calving, putting them on a truck, taking them to the sale barn, calves being born at the sale barn. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it was, and then and there was pairs that we sold also, you know, older pairs, and it's just there was a lot of logistics to to all to cram all that into the month of May, basically end of May, first part of June, shipping yearlings out, shipping pairs, shipping. Bread cows, I mean, it was, like I said, my phone is glued to my ear the whole time. Now, contrast that to what, we're, what we did this year. Um, we're only bringing about a third of our yearlings to the place here, because the rest of them uh, wintered in a, a few lots in the southern part of the state. So we're only bringing a third here. The other two thirds are, are gonna stay in the yards or get sold, which is, that's, I mean, there's an auction six days a week that we could take them to, you know, so marketability is easy. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just the, the flexibility of those yearlings is huge on a year like this um, because it's just not a stressful situation to, uh, I mean, yes, the markets are always stressful. It doesn't matter what you're selling. There's, there's an element of stress with, sure. with volatile markets, but as far as the logistics of doing it is so much yeah. easier. That leads into another question I have is, uh, well, two questions. Before I get to the, the one that initially came to mind, I want to ask, it doesn't seem to me like very many people would have taken on in 2017 the, the level of management that you did. So many phone calls, um, marketing cows that both have and haven't calved, and mm -hmm. all of that. Um, some might have gritted their teeth and bought that next truckload of hay if, if they could find it or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. That leads to the second question. There must have been a driving factor there, and I have a suspicion that it has to do with how you prioritize resources on this mm -hmm. ranch. Could you yeah. talk through that a little bit? Yeah, so, um, I mean, it, with, with all of the things we're doing, I guess we try to maintain a biblical perspective on it, what, what's important. You know, I mean, um, you know, our, our faith is the most important, so, um, that's always got to be first and if that's the most important that informs the rest of the decisions from there and so you know our you know family relationships is would be the next relate you know me as a husband and a father and a son uh, are all like that's the next category and then um, and then whatever material resources we have would come behind those but I guess and then as far as those go I look at them as what's the easiest What's the hardest thing to replace or the easiest thing to replace? So sure, however you want to look at it. So, you know, the land base is the hardest to replace. Um, it's pretty hard to find anything closer than what's here, <laughs> you know. Uh, so we're not going to, you know, burn this place out and then go try to find a different one somewhere. So so the land is the hardest to replace. Um, I would say the forage is the second hardest to replace because um, we need a lot of it to feed all the animals. So either we have to grow it which takes a year, <laughs> you know, it, it takes a while to grow it, or we have to haul it in, which is a lot of freight, and it's got to come from somewhere. So, so the forage is, is the second hardest. Then the next one would be the livestock. Um, you know, again, they're, um, as much as I, you know, I like what we're doing genetically, they're just cows, and we can start over with something else and, and maybe be even more profitable, I guess, you know. But so the, the cows, again, six days a week, we could, sell them and buy them back again. And then the equipment would be, or you know, whatever other resources, um, those are even easier to liquidate or replace or whatever we need to do. So. Okay, that, that makes a lot of sense uh, to me is that, that uh, when we assign a priority level that's, that's pretty firmly rooted, um, especially when it comes in, in ranch resources, land, the year's production of forages and livestock, and the livestock themselves even have a priority order, which you've already discussed a little bit. Mm -hmm. you know, obviously, the, the cow herd uh, is probably takes first place. 
yeah. um, that they'll be cold last uh, or you'll get deep into them last. Mm -hmm. um, but those yearlings and the sheep, they take their place on the chopping block pretty early yeah. when it comes yeah. to disaster planning. And that could come from any number of sources. I think Jim mentioned it was drought planning is really risk management or disaster planning. It could be mm -hmm. if you're winter grazing 100 inches of snow. It could be flood. It could be drought. It could be grasshoppers, mm -hmm. hail. Any number of things could cause you an unexpected shortage of forage. Yeah. And sometimes in the blink of an eye. At least with drought, these are usually slowly worsening conditions and we should be slowly adapting. Or yeah. maybe rapidly adapting in some cases if, we've, if we're overstocked. Mm -hmm. But if we're appropriately stocked to start with, these are things that, that can happen over time without degrading the resource. Yeah. It's funny you mentioned, you know, the 100 inches of snow. And I, what I, I've actually found that winter grazing and planning for that is more stressful than planning for a drought because, like you said, winter can start in a day. Mm -hmm. And drought, we have a lot of lead time usually to make adjustments and, and build a plan. But I can remember a few times where we had, you know, not even a lot of snow, but then it warmed up and then it froze again. And now all my corn stalks that I had planned on grazing for the next 60 days are all under a half an inch of ice or whatever. And mm -hmm. and now we got to switch gears yesterday, you know, into a different a different mindset. But I think that's, but that builds in just that forward thinking yep. mindset of, you know, planning for either a drought or a, or a, a forage deficiency or a forage, you know, um, mm -hmm. excess and, and then being able to flex our management to, to meet that. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, it's not real easy to, when you've got a really good year, and more grass than you know what to do with. It's not as easy to do that with, with cows and calves or as inexpensively mm -hmm. as you know, bringing in some, either going and buying some yearlings or bringing in some stalkers from, that someone else owns and custom grazing them, mm -hmm. um, or some entirely other species of animal that still serves a grazing mm -hmm. purpose. I, I think one thing that kind of fits into that um, flexibility is not feeling like we have to own every hoof that's on the place because that takes a lot of emotion out of it. Um, I even think about like this year that all but a few of our stalker yearlings are 150 miles away. It's really easy for me to say, let's keep them there for another week because they're not, I'm not watching my hay pile get smaller and, or, or, you know, them reaching through my corrals, trying to get that little piece of, you know, a spear of green grass. Um, it's like, it just takes a lot of the emotion out of it. Um, even more so, you know, like the sheep coming later, they're not my sheep. I don't even have to worry about the feed bill. I just have to say, I have to just prioritize our resource base and say, we don't, we can't bring them here until then. Now, yes, it affects my, you know, my pocketbook because that's, uh, you know, the, the income starts a little later than, than I'd like, but um, it's it's different than if I owned all the animals and I'm having to make all these decisions because, well, okay, if we're not going to turn them out, what are we going to do? Are we going to feed them? Are we going to sell them? You know, what are we going to do? So I think having at least one grazing animal in your place or one grazing enterprise that you don't own all of it makes it easier to, to get out of. And that's where the, the relationships come in. You know, um, and uh, having somebody you can trust to pay their bills on time, to follow through with what the agreement is, you know, that's, you can't, you can't even put a price on that, really. Yeah, so. yeah. And, and again, it, I, I see the, communi the importance of communication between you and the livestock owner being mm -hmm. incredibly important, and, and you mentioned it too, having a trusting relationship where communication goes both ways. Yep. Is, is critically important. And you might not get it right the first time. I think yeah. you did, but if you go and well, try this. No, you know, I, I didn't. The first no, the first didn't. year we ran yearlings, I didn't own any of them. And the performance was not what we had hoped, uh, or not what the owners had hoped. And some of it was because of a couple of mistakes I made, which we were able to kind of remedy the situation. But uh, again, going back to, you know, learning and and as a cow, growing up with cow calf, well, average daily gain is not something that we really were. I mean, the calves grew on the cow is whatever, you know, and our replacement heifers, we don't, we don't worry too much about um, cost of gain or rate of gain or whatever. As long as they got bred, we were happy. 
Well, now when there's somebody else that's got, you know, um, yearling steers that they're, and especially somebody that can run a calculator and yeah. saying, hey, we got to, this is what we got to get. This, their measuring yeah. stick is different than yeah. anything you had previously experienced. Yeah. yeah. And so, so they're going to come in and say, you know, hey, this is, you know, you made a mistake when your, you know, your, your shipping procedure costs us too much shrink or, you know, your grazing that you did here in this part. They didn't gain any, anything during that time, or you know, just those kind of things. Like, oh, oh, I never, I never knew that. I never thought of that. And so, no, that that was. Uh, <laughs> but because there's somebody that that we trusted, and they still trust us, and you know, we were able to make things right. That didn't. We didn't burn any bridges, even though I made some mistakes. Uh, we were able to still do business together and and uh, get it right the next time. So. Well, that's an opportunity to plug the mentor network again. Um, yep. If you're going to, when, when drought breaks, if you are going to diversify your, your operations income streams, um, Luke or someone else on the mentor network may be a, a good contact to make. Um, just to pick up some of those lessons learned so that you don't have to walk through the same fire that they did, figuratively at least. <laughs> It seems more and more, and Luke, you and I are roughly the same age, um, more and more in our lifetimes, it seems like agricultural commodities are traded on a global scale. Um, mm. so, so what's happening in Ukraine right now has an impact here. And not that it didn't always, but we're aware of it on a daily basis when you watch mm -hmm. or listen to the news or read the news. Um, markets change daily. The weather is anybody's guess, even though we have great forecasting models that tell us this summer is looking to be warmer and drier than normal. Mm. Um, how do you make decisions you know, for, for your family business in this environment? Well, I think a lot of it is kind of a lot of things we've already talked about as far as maintaining flexibility and not pigeonholing yourself into, we have to market these animals at this time and anything else is a disaster or um, so it's so if maintaining flexibility on when you can market um, products whether it's animals or feed or whatever um, and then also having um, a diverse array of things that you can market um, and this is something I feel like uh, it's easy to get overwhelmed with like it's it's a lot easier to I'll just sell your, you know, two pot loads of calves the first Saturday in November or whatever, you know, um, and that, that's worked in the past. Uh, but I think, as you're saying, with the volatility that we see, um, as well as the opportunity that we see for being able to market other things, we, we need to rethink that default setting of we just sell calves in the fall, and that's what we do. Um, if you can sell into different markets at different times of the year, you're less likely to catch the low, um, you know. That's that's part of it. But even within that is understanding the the markets that we're selling into. Um, not just is it higher than yesterday or is it higher than last month, but seasonally, what what's the best time to sell a bred cow or what's the best time to sell a six weight steer or, or you know just looking at kind of some some other angles besides just what's the absolute price right now. Um, the other thing that I've tried to become more aware of is this price relationships within a market. So I'll give a good example from 2017. Um, I had the opportunity. I could have sold. My neighbor was buying alfalfa from over by Groton, which, you know, it's 130 miles away. He's paying $150 a ton to bring it here. Um, at the same time, so I, I could have sold him the alfalfa that I had because I had I bought alfalfa the year before. I could have sold it to him for for 150 easily because he didn't have all that freight. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, distiller's grain was, I could lay it in for about $88 a ton. So uh, if I'm thinking, as, so okay, I'll take a step back. We're not just cattlemen or, or livestock owners or ranchers. We're also feed salesmen. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, that's, that's the business we're really in because either we're selling our grass to our animals, we're selling the grass to somebody else's animals, or we're putting up feed, hay, or buying hay, and we're selling it to our animals or somebody else's animals. So if we take that mindset, 
we start looking at things differently. So going back to the, uh, the distillers grain. So on a per unit of protein, it, the distillers grain was a, a much better buy than the alfalfa. So I, I could have traded one for the other. I could have sold all my alfalfa, bought equal tons of distillers grain and had 50 bucks in my pocket. And then within six months, those prices inverted. And I could have bought alfalfa back for $90 a ton and sold distillers grain for 100 and 70 or something like that. So, and I wouldn't have gotten out of my feed at, at all. This was just trading within the market. And um, so I've been watching that pretty closely this time around to see, okay, Hayes going crazy. Well, unfortunately, so is the Steelers Green. But um, just having this, this idea of trading um, animals or commodities or feedstuffs within a market, um, you know, that's, it, it, that's an okay thing to do. And we can't just get so tunnel vision that I gotta buy second cutting alfalfa, or I gotta I gotta have this thing. I gotta have you know eight weight steers to sell in September. Oh yeah, it's just we have to look at it differently. Certainly, so. some people might try to feed through it. You kind of planted mm -hmm. this idea in my head is that uh, um, if the hay that you would normally feed, you know, kind of the the tunnel vision. Uh, this is what we've always done. If that's not producing or there's not going to be enough of it, there are other options out there, right? Mm -hmm. And if you're not comfortable or experienced in building rations, then find yourself a nutritionist that yep. can help you, especially if you're if you're feeding it to animals that have a floor uh, of, of requirements yep. to be met. So You also talked about trading within that market and and running the numbers. That's something we haven't really touched base on yet, but uh, uh, understanding the true costs of doing things rather than simply being busy, making decisions, you know, putting out mm. this emergency. Now this one, moving from crisis to crisis. I'm a fan of, of Dave Ramsey, he's the financial guy. I think he has uh, some programs on the radio. Mm. Uh, occasionally I stumble across him read a couple of his books. One of the things that he said that sticks to me and I constantly remind myself of is you're the boss of your family business, whatever it is. Don't busy yourself all the time doing the $10 an hour jobs at the mm -hmm. expense of the $100 per hour jobs. You're the manager. Yes, you maybe need to find time or a way to get all the tasks done, but you need to be placing time and effort into strategy mm -hmm. that makes the money or spends the money in some cases, but you know, you're know you charged with the profit at the end of the year or at the end of the month or at the end of the cycle, whatever that is. Yep. So, uh, yeah, it's easy to just do because we like to do and not do the things that require effort and thought. But really what we're talking about building a grazing plan build that incorporates disaster planning for when forage is short, a response when forage is good, right? Yeah. Or crops are good or what have you. Um, those things aren't always comfortable, but they're often the most profitable if we've laid in some good thought. Yeah. And not waiting until the situation is upon you before looking into it. Um, yeah, that's, that's uh, I and I'm, I'm sure somebody else has probably said it throughout this series, but um, I think it was, um, I think it was Eisenhower said, plans are useless, but planning is essential. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that's a really key thing because, uh, yeah, I mean, like we already talked about, my grazing plan has already changed and it's not even the first of May. But by doing the planning and paying attention to all these things, you just develop this familiarity with the whole system, you know, um, because you're you're paying attention to all those pieces and trying to put them together, and so then as things change, you notice them because you're paying attention. And and when you need to make a change, it's just it's a lot easier because you understand it. I mean, I think about somebody that's you know got a um, a vehicle uh, you know like an older vehicle that they it's their pride and joy. Well, they know that thing from front to back, and if something's not quite right, they can tell and they know how to fix it. Whereas you know, if I drive it once a month. And I never changed oil on it. I don't. I can't tell that it's pulling to the left more than it was mm -hmm. last month because I'm not familiar enough with mm -hmm. it. So, 
I think doing those plans and and uh, working through it, you just you just get this intimate knowledge of your of your land that um, makes it a lot easier to make those changes when you need to. Sure. Non-operating landowners or uh, or new landowners, you know, we've seen a pretty large influx of, of folks from other parts of the country, maybe even the world, mm -hmm. into South Dakota, even some of our smaller towns. If you're a listener or viewer on this series and uh, don't have the context that Luke was just mentioning, that, that secondhand, uh, or not secondhand, but that, that firsthand knowledge of we're moving into a drier period, um, boy, markets are changing, rents are changing, what have you. Um, here again, to find, find somebody that does have those things and, and truly has your best interests in mind. The mentor network comes to mind, but it could be a lender. It could be, um, you know, the folks at the coffee shop have a lot of great knowledge. Sometimes they, they come up in these conversations as, as, as not adding a lot of value, but they, they can. Mm -hmm. um, just building your own network. And so if you're new to this, uh, finding those folks that, that will play on your team and, uh, and, and speak with your best interests in mind are, are going to be really helpful. Mm -hmm. Throughout our discussion, Luke, I'm, I'm gaining an understanding that, that you probably, even after grazing or leaving behind, or at least it's your goal to leave behind more grass than, than some folks would even still turn livestock into. Hmm. They might see that as a waste. You're seeing it as something else, an investment maybe. Uh, speak to that a little bit. Sure. Well, um, I'll preface it by saying there are some pastures that would take shorter than others for different reasons. And, you know, every, every pasture is its own kind of context that we're dealing with. So um, it's not that we never graze anything short, but it's that we always make sure that there's a recovery, a sufficient recovery. Um, and uh, so, it, so the, the shorter it goes, the longer the recovery, the more, I'm, the longer I'm going to wait until I would go back in there. But um, I mean, one of the things that I try to do is plan for, a year-round grazing operation. Now, the last two years, that's been doable. Um, you know, other years, it's not. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to do that, you got to keep some. You got to stockpile some grass um, to use, especially. Uh, so I can use corn stalks up until usually about the first of March. Um, once the frost starts coming out, then we kind of got to get off the field so we're not causing some damage there. So I got to have. I got to grow grass this summer to graze in March and April of uh, 23. So there's going to be some pastures that don't either don't get grazed at all or get grazed real light so that there's plenty of regrowth to graze uh, early next year. Um, and there's a chance that we won't get to use it because it'll be under snow. Mm -hmm. But that just sets it up that much better for the next time around. And I can start on those in you know, as soon as the snow is coming off and melting, we can turn in there. And having that that extra forage is, is peace of mind. And I don't know about anybody else, but I hate feeding hay when it's muddy. I, I just want to get them out. I want to get them out. They're happier. I'm happier. You know, we're not getting stuck. Um, it's just, it, that's my favorite time of the year is when we can stop feeding. If we're feeding, we can stop feeding or even leaving corn stalks. The cows are never happier than going from corn stalks to grass, you know, that um, when that time comes. So it's just a, um, it's a stress reliever in uh, just watching the cows be happy. And it's a stress reliever knowing that, hey, we, you know, we got a good start. And, uh, you know, and like I said, having the flexibility of varying our stocking rate. Okay, so if we got extra grass that we carried over from last year, well, we can, we can adjust our stocking rate to match it for the next year. Yep, yep. That can be from within or those custom grazed mm -hmm. animals, whatever class or species they are. Yeah. And uh, um, yeah, that's that's good. Yeah. And and you're not out of grass or out of feed immediately, hardly ever. Right. Because you're stocked appropriately to start with, mm -hmm. and and uh, usually, except in case of flood, hail, or fire, or or deep snow, you know. The, the conditions aren't changing so rapidly that you yep. have to immediately 
responding. You did mention that earlier. Is that you, know, you get a big snow cover? <coughs> excuse me. That uh, that then starts to melt, and makes that crust. It's not that deep snow prevents grazing, right? Yeah. Talk about that. It's maybe not necessarily the context of the series, but but uh, I've heard people say, well, the snow gets too deep here, we can't graze. Is that yeah, true? it depends on the kind of snow. Mm -hmm. You know, there's some uh, some snow that um, is soft enough the ca cattle can still muzzle through it. You know, mm -hmm. they just bulldoze it out of the way, basically. Um, you know, we got some hills here, so we get any wind at all, which obviously is pretty typical in this part of the world. Um, and half the pasture is going to be blown off anyways. Um, so, uh, which is a little bit of a challenge to figure out, okay, how much is actually out there? Right. You what know, can, what is a what's available? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, I, yeah, there's years where we, I would say our corn stalks are more susceptible to snow than our, than our you know, like our, our uh, pastures mm -hmm. would be. So, but at the same time, I don't think financially or economically be the wise thing to try to plan years worth of grazing on just pasture. The corn stalks are, are too good of a resource to, to not maximize their use of, you know. So, um, like I said, I, my goal is to get to the 1st of November before turning to corn stalks and then do corn stalks till the 1st of March and then have have grass space from the 1st of March till the 1st of November. So. Corn isn't a huge thing, very far west anyhow, mm -hmm. um, in South Dakota. It's planted more and more all the time, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, the reliability or, or the availability of finding those to graze for more than just a handful of operators is, is a little bit smaller. Um, talk about how, how do you know when to stop? You know, as far as utilization is concerned, for managing that land in the interest of both yourself and the landowner. You're talking about with corn stacks? Yeah, if if yeah. you don't, if they're not yours. Sure. Uh, so, I, and most of my the vast majority is rented corn stacks. So I, I do have to think about what's the farmer uh, seeing, what's he what's he want out of this mm -hmm. this uh, relationship. So, um, and for me, it's a, it's a real actually a really easy. Um, formula, if you will. First of all, we, we're uh, blessed to be in an area that has, I've never run out of corn stalks. Um, I've run out of winter. Mm -hmm. I've run out of snow mm -hmm. or, I, I, you know, I've run out of things, but never, I didn't say, well, I just wish I had another quarter of corn stalks mm -hmm. I could go to. Um, so take that for what it's worth. But Hopefully what, we didn't give away a trade secret. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't think there'll be any shortage of corn for people that are looking for or corn stalks, but the, uh, I just look for husks. And it, when I kind of have a when I when I drive 50 feet and I didn't see, you know, more than one husk, then it's time to time to move them. And the old rule of thumb that I've heard and probably a lot of other people have is one acre for one cow for one month. And unless we had like a real disaster for a corn crop, we I've never had to do less than that. Um, there's been quite a few times we've been able to do more than that, um, but. I also want to make sure there's residue, you know, going back to soil health principles. I know that the the farmer doesn't want those cows to eat everything except for the stock. And I don't want them to get that to that point either because they're, you know, they're going to eat the best stuff first. And once the, once the corn is gone and once the husks are gone, yeah, the leaves are still okay. But, you know, every day that they're eating the, the, that stuff is a day where I got to feed more protein, which is an additional cost. And, and uh, at least in this part of the world, you know, the the rent is all based on a per cow per day. And so it's not on a per acre basis. So I pay the same if she had a really good diet as if I left her there too long and she had a poor diet. So um, yeah. it's from a cost standpoint. Which, which, yeah, will cost you more in the long run. Yep. Because you need to put that condition back on before she gets. Yep. Yeah. Or shortly thereafter. Yeah. I mean, and there are some... Obviously, there's challenges with fence or water um, this past year because of um, the drought stress corn and a lot of years in the ground. We actually lost a couple cows because there was a little more corn out there than I thought. So, um, but I missed opportunity there. I should have had some cold cows to turn out and and uh, put some weight on something. You know, um, but like I said, I, look, I can always look back and say, all right, next year I'm gonna or the next time this scenario happens. 
this is what I need to be looking for. These are the opportunities that could present themselves, and I need to be thinking about that. So. Good. Unplanned question, but but helps me provide a little bit of frame mm -hmm. of reference with something that I have less experience with, but uh, is a resource here locally for you. So. Good. Yeah. So Luke, I'm ashamed to say that this is the first time that I've been able to visit your operation. What does your typical grazing rotation look like? Now, maybe it's different here during the drought, maybe not. Mm -hmm. You can explain that. But uh, you know, as far as rotation lengths, um, you know, sure. how do you manage livestock across the ranch? Well, that's a tricky question because I feel like there's nothing typical here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's not a typical year. There's not a necessarily a typical strategy. You know, I mean, that I have a hard time doing the same thing two times in a row because I always thought, oh, I think we could do it this, like we, we could change this and get a little better, you know, better impact or better outcome or whatever. Um, so I'm, I'm always tinkering on things, trying to make them a little better. Um, I guess in a, in a, a dry year, uh, I'll, I'll say in a normal year, we would, uh, the cows, uh, we, we'd run two different cow herds um, and they would move to a new pasture roughly every three to seven or eight days, 10 days maybe in the biggest ones. And, um, and they would generally go through a pasture just once. Um, and uh, just, and you know, some pastures are bigger than others and sometimes to get, to get it to a less than a week grazing period, we're gonna use some temporary electric fence to cut it in half or whatever. Um, but I feel like that, uh, that one, keeping the cattle in a pasture for more than a week, they're going to come back, be, especially during the, you know, May and June, they're going to be coming back and regrazing plants. And that's just, we don't want that to happen. That's kind of the, that's the main driver of that, that grazing period is not taking the second bite. Um, and then not taking the second bite with, without a long rest period, you know, um, so. Yeah. That doesn't mean you never visit a pasture right. for a second time in yep. the year, but it's, but it's unusual, and when it does happen, there is a, a compensatory recovery period built in. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. so in a normal year, that's where we use the yearlings to to take the to do the second grazing event or the first one, depending on you know if the cows are not going to get to this pasture until you know August fifteenth. Well, we'll run the yearlings through there and graze it lightly in May or June, um, and try to always have absolute minimum thirty days rest. I would rather have it be 60. Um, and so it just, again, it depends on which pasture. Some are more dominated by a species that can probably handle a little shorter rest period and others we're really trying to make it as long as possible. Um, and there's some pastures we won't graze twice at all. Um, so just, it's really a, a moving target as far as that goes. But um, uh, now in a dry year, it's just once. We don't graze anything twice during the growing season. Now. Like I said, we we'll, we'll try to save or stockpile some grass for for March, which you know that grass grew the year before. So we might graze it in May or June, and it's got enough regrowth that we can come back to it in March. And so it's just that that's kind of how that works. But we do try to you know move, like I said, about once once a week or more um, okay. throughout the year. Okay, so. that's good. And you explained the why. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that when a plant is regrazed, that second bite you talked about, uh, we cause usually some pretty significant root shrinkage, mm -hmm. and plant vigor is going to go down. If we're all, you know, the grazing event itself is a stress event. Couple that with extended drought periods, and, and we put that plant, especially if it's a desirable one, one that we want to keep at a real competitive disadvantage if we haven't then accommodated, like you say, for the recovery. Mm -hmm. So. With that framework or that groundwork laid out, do you expect your land to bounce back rapidly? Maybe more rapidly than a conventional operator season long days? Yeah. I, you know, I think so. And, I, and I, I can say that with some confidence because I saw it last summer. Um, there was uh, one pasture in particular. Um, we had a little miscommunication with the, sh the, the herders, with the sheep, and they they went scorched earth on this about five acres. I mean, it was, oh, it was bad. I took some pictures just, 
Yeah, like I said, documenting mistakes mm -hmm. so that I, okay, we don't want to do this again. Um, and because it was, yeah, they had it. And if you've been around sheep, you know that they, they can graze it pretty short. I think they ate, they even ate half of the litter that was on the ground. I mean, they really, I was worried about the sheep or the ewes' performance because <laughs> they were, you know, they were, um, the, uh, it was breeding season. And so, yeah, it was, I was not feeling very good about that, that event. And, uh, that was like, I, I, and I took a picture of that as like July, or no, uh, it was August 9th, I, th I think. I went, Burn in your memory, you said that. Yeah, <laughs> well, I, and it's on my, you know, on my photo album or whatever on my, on my phone. And I went back, I think it was like the 20th or 22nd of August, we, and we'd had that first round of rain, and I don't remember how much rain we'd had. And I was just blown away by how quickly that grass grew. I mean, I, I put my my hat down on the ground. I took a picture for some scale. I mean, th th there was grass that had been grazed down to the dirt that was taller than the crown of my hat. And that was in like 10 days. It was unbelievable um, how quickly that grass had grown. And I know that that would not have been the case if that would have had a history of abuse or if that grass had been nipped off all summer. But, you know, going back to what I was saying earlier, that grass was able to not be stressed at all, all year, other than from the weather. But as far as grazing events, they didn't have any until, you know, early August. And this was cool season grass that um, just really was able to come back. And and so, so yeah, I, I guess I can say that I've seen how quickly some of that, and, and not to, to um, you know, pass judgment on, on anybody else's management, sure. but it's not hard to drive down the road and see pastures that, yeah, they got green after it rained, but they didn't grow. Mm -hmm. You know, they, there's no production. There was it just changed colors, mm -hmm. and uh, so yeah. You have healthy plants with robust root systems. Right. The season long grazer has plants that are surviving with pretty small root systems, and probably if it's if it's a, a decades long history of those two managements compared side by side, you probably have a very diverse species mm -hmm. mix that, that provides a whole host of nutrient density for grazing animals, whereas, uh, you know, season long, every year at the same time, and usually very severe utilization, uh, it's probably just one or two species that don't offer that, that really nutrient dense package yeah. from a whole bunch of different species. So, uh, interesting, and absolutely, I would, I would concur. I, I've seen the same response, mm -hmm. is that while you learn something, um, good and bad, is that, yeah, once in a while, if you have to, for one reason or another, really take a pasture short, if that's an, an exception rather than the rule, it's going to recover pretty rapidly. Mm -hmm. Especially as, as long as that next couple of seasons, you really treat it nice. Right. Yeah. And that's where, you know, kind of our earlier discussion about stockpiling some of that grass and w wasting it, so to mm -hmm. speak, that's the cushion for those times where, okay, you know what, we got to keep them here. We got our shipping date set, and we know that this is going to take some abuse, but it, it's prepared for it, yeah. and we have a plan for how we're going to let it recover. You know, it, it, it does give you some latitude on, on that. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. And the other thing, too, is that heavy grazing at the right time of year on the, on the right species can drive us to a desired yeah. outcome. Yeah. The yeah. exotic cool season grass is exactly. like smooth grown. Kentucky bluegrass, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, and crested wheatgrass are three key examples where mm -hmm. maybe we have to target it pretty, pretty intense, usually pretty early, and mm -hmm. then rest. Yep. That will allow the opportunity for maybe the more desirable native species to, to make a foothold. Yep. To be able to move from one pasture to the next on average every seven to ten days when, when things are normal, but even mm -hmm. in a drought situation, that suggests to me you must have water developments pretty well distributed around the ranch. Um, mm -hmm. Some folks that maybe aren't in that situation may use this period of drought and maybe even the proceeds from some sale of livestock to, to invest in water infrastructure. What's that look like here? Uh, that's one thing I've come to really appreciate about um, the way that my parents went about preparing for drought, going all the way back to the late 80s, they, they have 
spent a lot of money on on uh, well systems and pipeline and water tanks and uh, with very few exceptions uh, I would change any of it I mean it, it's it was it was all done right and um, has I mean it, when I think about how to compare to water developments it's like only have if you don't have it it's like having only first gear in your pickup you can get a lot of work done but you're not going to get very far you know like your your the radius of work you can accomplish is pretty small mm -hmm. and um, so you know we're able to utilize 100 percent of the ranch every year whether it's wet or dry because we have water that isn't dependent on you know stock dams so and, and yep mm -hmm. um, and even you know last year there's even on some lease ground there's some springs that you know, um, are really good springs that, you know, almost had no water in them by the time. That was my mistake, <laughs> waiting, too, waiting so long to get to them. But, uh, um, yeah, it, it's, there's a lot of peace of mind of knowing that I can get fresh water anywhere. And, and in the past, a lot of it was, you know, buried pipe, six foot deep, you know, cement um, skirting around a uke tire, you know, really a, a well-built permanent, winterized, you know, um, type of a system. And there's absolutely, that's important if you're going to do, you know, graze till November 1st and then start again the 1st of March. Um, but we've also kind of realized that, you know what, sometimes we don't know exactly where we should put that tank. And rather than make this big investment in a permanent site, we'll use like above ground water line um, and kind of more, a little bit more temporary type setup. And if we like it and we say, yep, we could use this, you know, during the dormant season, then we can go ahead and invest in a more permanent solution. But being able to have it flexible or easy to add on and go a different direction or go with a different pasture or whatever, that, that, um, that's important to have the flexibility built in. Um, I guess another thing that uh, has been a, a, a good thing, I think, is being able to help out neighbors that... Um, that need it, you know. I there was there's been but last summer I had one neighbor that you know his they didn't have any good water in the pasture and he asked if they could run a line over to his place and you know by the next day at noon I had it set up and and he was really thankful for it and you know just helping each other out with those kind of things and uh, it, that's that goes a long way towards those relationships you know that we that we want to have with our neighbors and um, so. Yeah, and like I said, familiarizing oneself with how these things work and what kind of materials to use or what kind of equipment you need to, to do different things. Uh, I mean, I've got about six different types of floats <laughs> that I'll use depending on the situation, the water quality, you know, where it's coming from. And, um, just, yeah, you got to, like I said, maintain flexibility, just like everything else. You know, it's not just a one-size-fits-all. Oh, everybody needs to put in this kind of a drinker or this kind of a system. Um, it's all situation dependent. Sure. Yeah. Source and distance to the source mm -hmm. and, and all of that, like you say, plays, plays a role. And yeah, yeah. If you don't have much of a pipeline or it was already there when you started, ask for help. Yeah. You know, your local contractors are a wealth of information, but mm -hmm. chances are it's drought, they're all busy. And yep. it's going to be weeks, if not months, before they can get to you. So if you're in a situation where you already own the equipment, or can go rent it and are going to do the work yourself, find somebody who's done it before to give you their opinions. And you know, uh, much like uh, the stereotypical farrier, horseshoer, or even some you know military background, I'm going to really throw stereotypes here, is that they're going to have a very deeply firm, firm, deeply held opinion, and they'll give it to you willingly. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, in in your case, you found that many things work, mm -hmm. just uh, depends. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. One more question, Luke. You walked into an operation that already had a grazing plan in place, a drought plan in place, but but you were charged with making it your own, and and getting buy-in, communicating that with all the stakeholders. Clearly, this has lasting value because you're continuing to do it and mm -hmm. making tweaks as needed. What kind of values are they? What, what comforts, what conveniences, what, mm -hmm. what, what dollars <laughs> does that mean for you? Yeah. Well, um, 
I mean, that, our, our deeded land, that, you know, I, I guess I should say, when I started when I, uh, here after college, or when I came back after college, we've sort of been in a continual expansion process and picking up leases or partnerships with neighbors that um, didn't necessarily have, well, definitely didn't have this, the type of grazing that we do, mm -hmm. or that I do, I guess. Um, generally, it was either season long or just a lot longer graze periods and smaller, more numerous herds rather than large herds. And so in some sense, a lot of those I've had to kind of start uh, without a lot of yeah. background of, you know, well, here's how, here's what works. Like, okay, that worked when there were 60 cows here. What about when there's 325, you know? Um, so I've, I've had to kind of make things up as I go in some of those cases. But I, I use some things like Web Soil Survey to get some some baseline. Here's what to expect in a good year. Here's what to expect in a normal or a unfavorable year or whatever. Um, and then <laughs> going to the water development, I, there's probably somebody a lot smarter than me that could have anticipated some of the problems I'd run into, <laughs> you know, figuring out flow rates and, and capacities and all that. So that's that's been sort of a work in progress. But um, having the now having the plan, having the experience, and having it documented, like, okay, this is how it worked. Here's what happened. Um, not only does it help me put every year into some context, I can look at back and say, well, okay, we had we had a really wet spring in 2011. Okay, well, what, what did we do then? I can look back and okay, this is how it kind of how it went. So it it provides some help in planning for similar types of years. Um, it also provides um, some documentation of improvements or, imp you know, the, the results of the improved management over time. And I haven't had to, well, I haven't really had this situation arise yet, but when it comes time, you know, I, some of my landlords are, you know, in their retirement years and they may or may not have kids that are interested in owning the property. But I know that's helped me maintain some leases because of the management and the way that I'm going about it and being able to communicate with them in a way that they can understand like okay here's here's how many grazing days we got last year here's how many grazing days we got the year before I can really explain myself and why we're doing what we're doing and and that sort of thing that and that goes a long ways in maintaining those relationships and um, um, making them feel like somebody's taking care of their their property yeah. Um, yeah. so it's easy for you can actually provide that document yeah. if they wanted to see it. You right. You're making fact-based decisions. Right. Rather yeah. than we always run here for two months. Yeah, like yeah. 80 head, no matter what. Yeah. Or 325 in your example because you run larger herds for shorter duration. Yeah, yeah. And, and it, being able to explain that. So, for example, I got one lease where the type of a water... Um, account that's set up with the rural water system is uh, so much gallon or so many gallons a month mm. and uh, which does not work at all <laughs> for you know I mean it's it's designed for 60 to 70 pairs yeah. for 12 months of the year the or, original or, intent yeah that fine, right? yeah, yeah it worked great and I mean we we blow through that in six days with mm -hmm. the, the herd size we got but we only need it for a month and a half mm -hmm. so uh, being able to go to them and say hey we need to change this this water account um, and here's why and being able to explain that and oh okay yeah yeah if the you infrastructure know. is there and the agreement can be modified yeah it's worth asking that question yeah. right yeah but then but again you know going back to what's the value lasting value in having that plan it, it is to be able to um, see what we've done in the past how we've improved and then make plans for the future and and just have the flex being able to make the flex or makes it make the changes and maintain the flexibility as the year goes along, so eventually someday, if you know, if we'd ever want to sell uh, some property, it's almost like having a service record on your vehicle and saying, "Hey, here's everything we did to it." You know, um, yeah, there's a washout over there, but this is what it looked like before, and because of our management, that washout is half as big as it was five years ago, and you know that speaks to the overall trend of the this land is getting better, and uh, you know, so yeah, there's a lot of values to it. I'm going to take. I'm going to summarize a few takeaways that I've gotten from our conversation thus far. Is is uh, a put the time and effort into planning, 
and learning, mm -hmm. uh, recognizing your mistakes and, and not, trying not to repeat them. Take photos. Mm -hmm. that's, that's one we haven't heard yet. Um, yeah, you may not be proud of the way your place looks right now, and that's okay. You don't have to go and show the world your photos. Right. You're welcome to if you if you come to a Grassland Coalition event and, and want some input or something like that. But take some photos, like Luke said, so that you can remember with clarity how bad it can look if, if, if it's to that degree. Um, secondly, be willing to adapt in all situations. Um, and... and that adaptation doesn't necessarily have to come in crisis. It could be adapting mm -hmm. to take advantage of a market condition or something like that. Um, gosh, there's so much here. We hope that you find value in it, like I found value in just having a conversation. Because having conversations like this makes me better able to do my job with other ranchers that, that I'm visiting with. So I thank you for your time, Luke. And uh, again, folks, here on the website, you'll find resources to not only Luke, but all of the uh, folks that signed up to serve as mentors uh, with the Grassland Coalition. So thanks again for your time. You're welcome.